Hi. I'm again. I'm David Pritchett from the Nevada State Office in Reno. Um, how are y'all doing after lunch? It's funny. You're doing funny after lunch. Um, so a lot of us hear about NEPA, or as some people I heard yesterday say, NEPA. And um, I'm going to go over what the basic law is and why federal agencies deal with it. And it's an acronym, of course, and I'll, um, I'll, I'm going to provide four potential definitions, and then we'll pick what, what NEPA really stands for in a couple of minutes. And uh, the presentation's a little thick, but um, hopefully the speaker is more animated. So um, this, is, this is me. Um, I joined BLM a few months ago after working at some other agencies who um, approach the law in their own unique agency way, too. So NEPA is a federal law from 1970. Um, and we remember our history. There's a lot of other uh, major environmental legislation that passed um, for, uh, through Congress, clean air, clean water, um, environmental protection um, review through EPA was from the 1970s era, including NEPA. It's a, overall, it's our most fundamental law about environmental protection and planning. Um, the language here from the original legislation is a little um, uh, poetic, but over time, it's very specific what it means. Um, all federal agencies are responsible to um, implement the law and manage it. Um, and from the original legislation here, it's also in this um, handout sheets that are sort of going around. Um, based, the whole basic point here, to quote the law, is to utilize a systematic interdisciplinary approach that will inspire the integrated use of the natural and social sciences and design arts in planning decision and decision making that have an impact on man's environment. So women came later, apparently, the way the law was written, but it's for it's, it's the environment, um, everything out there. So NEPA is, is it the National Environmental Protection Act? Is it the NASTY Environmental Protection Agency? Is it the National Environmental Policy Act? Or is it never, ever propose anything for people who needed a NEPA document for their project? Uh, NEPA is Policy Act not Protection Act, which is a common mistake people in classes uh, miss on their exams. And I'll explain why it's a policy, not really a necessary outcome. Um, basically, it's a, NEPA is a process about the federal decision maker before a decision is made, like a permit or a right-of-way, um, or to approve a plan. These are um, decisions agencies make. And to use the language of the law, they, the deciding agency has to take a hard look, that's the phrase in the law, at the action alternatives to what could happen, the environmental effects, and possibly mitigation to reduce the adverse effects. And it basically in NEPA, it's about disclosure and those great, fantastic environmental impact statements are a way to coordinate other kinds of federal legal compliance you know, under an umbrella. So like using this example with my umbrella picture, um, there's a whole suite of federal laws that often apply. And under NEPA, it's a way to sort of address everything in a single document so people don't wonder if something got missed. So um, here's a few examples from a transportation project you know, about how other federal laws for, say, drinking water or hazardous material or clean air, um, all kinds of issues could be encapsulated through what we call the NEPA process. And to review, it's um, it, it, under the law, agencies prepare a detailed statement for major federal actions significantly affecting the quality of the human environment. And that could almost mean anything, but um, over time, kind of honing down what applies and what doesn't apply has been done um, through the process. And the basic point here is that NEPA is about disclosure, um, 
not necessarily rules about um, standards to make a decision, but it's about knowing how the decision is made. And there's some court cases that help define the disclosure function of NEPA, like this upper one. It's a procedural mechanism to ensure consideration of environmental concerns. It does not mandate a particular result. And in another case from 1989, in the lower quote, uh, NEPA merely prohibits uninformed rather than unwise agency action. So essentially, an agency could decide in the end all kinds of things, but under the National Environmental Policy Act, everyone has to be really aware of why the decision was made and what the, other co what the consequences of the decision could be and um, what the other options were. But it doesn't prevent bad decisions. It merely m allows informed decisions, whatever they may be. So um, over time, we have some details that um, have evolved over the decades to really hone down how agencies like Bureau of Land Management go about the process. And I'm just quoting some examples here. You know, we have um, nationwide regulations through this obscure little agency called the Council for Environmental Quality that defines a lot of the details of how the law works. Uh, Department of Interior has guidance for people, the bureaus, including BLM, have their own policy book. There's a picture of the cover there that staff look at all the time. It was last revised in 2008. And for even more detail, there's a website called the NEPA Web Guide, which helps everyone interpret how do we interpret the manual, which is how we interpret the policy. So there's a lot of specificity over time in how we federal bureaucrats process the whole um, law. So again, um, when, an, when an agency does something, it's called an action, and that could be a project, a program, a permit decision, um, promulgating a rule. All kinds of things are collectively called an action, and um, you know, we all know examples of what BLM does, you know, permits, right-of-ways, land transfers. These are all actions that are subject to this review process. You know, here's some examples, you know, policies, plans, programs, projects. Um, these are generally the um, options here. And when we make decisions, we have a, a document and a product, I call them products, for how to follow the process with different kinds of um, documentation and verification. So. Um, Here's, this is the, the long list for the bureaucrats is this list. You know, there's, there's a decision product called a categorical exclusion, um, a determination of NEPA adequacy, notice of intent, environmental assessment, find a FONSI, um, uh, Henry Winkler's character, FONSI, um, finding of no significant impact. But from the public's perspective, um, there's a lot to this alphabet soup. But what we hear about a lot from the public's perspective is a, a potential project or proposed action can be reviewed and have typically one of three possible outcomes about how the process um, is met. And one is called, these are kind of names that I'm going to bring up later, one is called a categorical exclusion, a CE or CX sometimes. A more complex review is through a document called an environmental assessment, and a more complex um, product with more public involvement required is an environmental impact statement, which could um, be a lot of paper and a lot of megabytes on a file for a complex project. And we have, you know, we love process here. This is a, a chart you can't really read in complete detail, of course, but it helps us figure out how to navigate all these different outcomes of the NEPA process. And basically, we start with um, a description of what we're doing, and then a series of decisions, in a fl like this flowchart indicates, whether um, the project has a, an effect in the environment, yes or no. If yes, you start looking at a planning process. If no, you see if um, a current exclusion may apply. Anyway, it's a little, a little thick, but this, 
this is how we make sense of how the sausage is made in the review process. Um, for some quick examples, um, some actions by federal agencies are so routine, they're kind of, they have minimal environmental impact, and um, they could qualify for what we call an exclusion, a categorical exclusion. Um, simple things like uh, roads or um, uh, funding actions that, that kind of are routine and don't have something on the ground that's really significant. So there's a product called a categorical exclusion that's sometimes an option, except under what we call extraordinary circumstances. And here's a list of some examples of how an exclusion um, may not apply, and therefore you do a more complex analysis. For example, um, are unique natural resources of historic and cultural value affected? Then this first option doesn't apply. Are sensitive or endangered species affected? That's the answer is yes or no. If yes, then you do the next level of analysis. But my point is um, we have specific questions to sort of get to the answer of a complex process that the original law set up. Um, so if we're doing a more detailed um, analysis, there's a lot of things the public can participate in and also helps craft how the agencies look at the fulfilling the intent of the law. And um, one process which a lot of us have heard about, of course, is called scoping, you know, and that's where um, agency staff and sometimes requesting the public or other agencies ask to um, just put out some ideas about what could be the effect on the environment, something out in the landscape. Um, it's, call, it's called scoping. I'm going to get to this a little more later. And, and sometimes there's a regulated procedure where a request goes out to the public and say there's a 15 or 30 day window period to send back ideas. You know, there's a, say a road proposal or a mine proposal or something. Um, what, besides what the staff may know, what the public may have as input um, is invited through the scoping process. And the key thing about scoping is not general opinions, but to raise specific issues. And that they're called issues like what is, um, a point of disagreement, this debate, dispute, um, what are uncertainties, and this helps shape what the NEPA document, the analysis, may um, address. And an another key component throughout the whole process is called um, formulation of alternatives. And these, an alternative is a way to get to um, the point of the question. Do, say the idea, say a potential project is an electric transmission line from point A to B, the alternatives could be different pathways on the landscape to get there. So um, a range of alternatives are brought up in the analysis and under the law, one of the alternatives is called the no action alternative. So everything else can be sort of put in comparison for um, the status quo. So, so it's all kind of relative effect. Another um, sort of basic component that people hear about in the NEPA universe is what is the affected environment. So the document will describe current conditions, the trend of the resource, you know, like in wildlife populations, uh, water quality trends that are air pollution. You know, that these are the kinds of the issues we know about as baseline. And then another component of the report is called an analysis of environmental consequences about if the project or different alternatives for the project were implemented, um, what are the effects? And then those are put in the discussion to help the final decision. I know it's a little thick here, but um, here's some examples. Now, in environmental consequences, you know, there's you got to sort of think ahead as a team. You know, in the cartoon here, there's a, um, a baby nursery there next to the um, predatory dingo farm. Sh you know, should you think ahead about 
approving a permit for the child nursery next to the existing condition you know of the coyotes or dingoes or wolves or whatever um, you know you think you know, think ahead like that in a more s serious line um, here's some examples of how uh, the NEPA process um, may look at questions and this one is overly general but sometimes it shows up in reports um, you know here's something about uh, air quality and emissions and if you can see the text here which is from a real document um, a while ago in, in another state um, you know it, the discussion is about would depend on the length of the pipeline could do this could do that it's a little vague and probably would not survive a legal challenge just as an example there's a better approach when you look at the environmental consequence or the impact you look at sort of the the worst possible the maximum level of activity and here's a geothermal example um, you know, emission of so much carbon dioxide per hour per year. You're starting to get quantitative, which is a key um, outcome of a successful report. You got some numbers to work with so you can figure out the kind of impact. And another example, here's one about some um, pesticide or herbicide use. This one, instead of worst case scenario, is sort of typical scenario because um, you may not know at the exact moment. And you can see from the description, we're talking about um, droplet sizes, um, herbicide volume, the size of the equipment. This is great stuff for a report because it takes out the ambiguity. So, you know, that's just an example of simple or hard ways to write up this part of the analysis. So, again, um, this is a more simple diagram. It's a NEPA is a process that the agencies use, and they follow a, a series of yes or no decisions, more or less, on a flowchart. And that helps define whether we know the, out, the environmental impact is significant, like bad, really bad. It's called significant. Um, and if it, if it is or is not, that helps define the complexity of the um, analysis and the report. So um, let's try some examples here. So, um, so say if we're, we have an idea, proposed action in the upper left part of our flowchart thinking, you know, the first question is, does an existing categorical exclusion apply? If yes, and it has no other extraordinary circumstances, that list I showed before, you know, then the, the categorical exclusion document can be prepared uh, fairly easily, and then the process is done. Um, if, uh, if that's not an option, if, but if a, some other environmental review document, another environmental assessment or environmental impact statement exists, then maybe the action already is covered, as we say. So the second um, column here, you could just write a, a finding called a, a DNA, Determination of NEPA Adequacy, that just sort of says we've already looked at this and this is already part of the old description. If things are less certain, um, could the effect be significant or not? Um, there's a two-tiered process and one uh, level of analysis produces something called an EA, environmental assessment, and that analysis sort of based on what I showed before gets to um, whether the impacts are significantly adverse or not. And so, so preparing an environmental assessment is focused on a, sort of answering that question. And you could see at the lower right diagonal arrow, if the answer is yes after some level of analysis, then a more thorough report called the Federal Environmental Impact Statement is done. If the impacts are still not significant, then the agency makes a, f a, a determination, a decision um, through a product called a FONSI, finding of no significant impact. Um, and once people work on these projects, this pathway becomes really instinctive about how things work. So um, I'm just going to run through a few examples of a, one kind of document we see a lot called an environmental assessment. Um, 
which is why sometimes they take a while and they're complex and they occupy some staff time is because there's sort of required elements um, and in the purpose of one, you know, we have to, to remember the point of NEPA is disclosure and public awareness. So the document has to describe what the proposal is. Um, and for BLM, is the proposal already consistent with an existing resource management plan? Um, that's an important um, uh, revelation in the, in the document process. And um, the NEPA process also helps invite public review and public participation and disclose you know, the, the environment affected, potential impacts, and it also can um, describe ways to reduce the impact through mitigation measures. And like I said in the chart before, if some of the impacts are definitely significant, then it's guidance about preparing a comp more complex environmental impact statement. So um, to get really wonky here, which I'll not dwell on more than half a minute, um, but we also have a sort of a required table of contents or outline of what goes in an environmental assessment document, and that helps shape the thinking of the agency people who prepare them. Because um, over time, the outline and the content and who's doing it, where, what, and why are all um, routine components so we don't leave things out. And there's sort of now pretty clear rules about how you set up one of these documents under these contents. And eventually at the end, um, there's sort of a formal finding document um, called a decision record or a finding of no significant impact, which is where um, the agency declares, yes, we met the requirements and here's our um, decision that it's analyzed and then the federal action can happen like the permit or the right of way or whatever. So um, from a lot of your audience here, more from the public perspective, um, there's a lot of opportunities to get involved in the process and provide input. Um, there's a, um, a document that's really easy to find at many websites called The Citizen's Guide to the NEPA. Um, that's from 2007. Um, there's uh, BLM documents that the staff use, but you, anyone could look them up. It's called the NEPA Handbook. Um, when an agency contemplates something, they often have to put a federal register notice, and BLM and other agencies will issue a news release. So there'll um, be ways to find that way. Um, we're, we're, we have a process called e-planning through our BLM website. Um, where whatever's going on at the different BLM districts has a list of ongoing planning projects and people can go there and find out the status of things. So, and the method of participating is people can uh, provide input as an individual, as a non-governmental organization, or if they're part of an agency, you know, local, state, or other federal agency, they um, all have a way to provide input um, through uh, meetings that invite comment and through formal commenting when a draft document is made available. Um, so my point here is there's a lot of um, opportunities to, to jump in the process and it's better, the er you know, the earlier the better. So when people provide comments, um, they have to be substantive, which is sort of a phrase under the law. And instead of just um, expressing a like or dislike for an industry or the location or whatever, um, the way to really have a comment addressed um, that the agencies have to do is to make the comment really stay on point and so, for example, in the list here, um, is the accuracy of the document correct or incorrect? Um, it was the method, it may be accurate, but was the method done sound? These are all the kinds of opportunities for input that do get a response in the revised document. 
And another um, key component that's especially uh, critical in the whole process is which alternatives to the project were put in the analysis and can people think of other alternatives that get to the same purpose? Um, so the back to public comment for substantive comments, there's a lot of venues here. This is a quick list. There, you know, the way the agencies go about their process, you know, they often will publish an, a notice sort of inviting ideas. There's a draft document, a final document. There's a, for sometimes in an environmental assessment, there's a window between the publication of the document and then the final decision, which is the opportunity to revise the decision before it goes final. Um, there's a whole process to deal with cooperating agencies. We, the picture here is from a, a book we published uh, a couple years ago about um, how to work with other agencies and, you know, especially have field trips. And um, as I mentioned before, we're really ramping up use of our website through a system called um, e-planning, electronic planning, and um, the NEPA register. So if you look around at our BLM website, you can find um, different documents in progress and um, find the right venue to comment, you know, should you like to. Um, so again, on public comment, there's the original notification, there's comment on the draft document, um, and uh, comments between the, the final document and the final decision by the agency. Um, back, a lot of focus of public comments, back to our procedural flow chart, is what is a significant impact and what is not. And the process um, like a, has a specific element called mitigation measures. Mitigation means really to make something not as bad as it could be. That's right from Latin, mitigare means soften up. Um, so a uh, key part in our planning process is often when an impact is described, is it significant or not? And a, if it looks to be significant, the project can incorporate mitigation measures right up front. Um, so that could be like how to reduce noise, how to reduce dust, how to limit maybe times of the year to avoid disturbances to wildlife, things like that. And, that, and by incorporating elements into the project from the start, the agency making the decision can conclude with these mitigation measures part of the effort, um, the whole overall project can still be found to have no significant impacts. And that um, helps the process go along. If still in the end, um, if you look at our flow chart on the right side, if still in the end the final project does have significant environmental impacts, um, the report or the environmental impact statement just describes it, it, admits it, and everybody knows about it, and then the decision by the agency can still happen, but it's all in full disclosure. And um, this gets me to some emerging policy with, um, let's sort of go through this one. Through BLM, um, we're, in my, my interpretation is we're, um, interpreting farther and wider what makes good mitigation and there's a, a policy that's like a draft form a year ago looking at mitigation from a regional perspective and this uh, diagram just sort of shows our we love flow charts it sort of shows our thought process about um, how to uh, look at existing regional plans as a way to apply to a specific project that's being analyzed under NEPA. And the, the open-ended questions are sort of how far and how, how wide can mitigation occur for a particular project. This picture is kind of the most extreme theory out there. We've got, you know, e um, eco-regions in Western North America, kind of similar conditions on the ground. 
and that helps sort of shape where a potential mitigation e effort could happen in a broader context rather than making a decision that could leave doubt with the public. So this is just something that's going out there and, and for large projects, um, it's pretty handy to have this policy basis. So um, for that, I'll uh, conclude for now. This is um, my contact information at the Nevada office. I work closely with someone else you may have heard of, um, Marguerite Adams, um, who's been there a long time and it, we're, we share a lot of duties about helping people at our BLM field and district offices um, coordinate uh, our projects and to help our people in the field when they um, comply with the National Environmental Policy Act. So uh, that's all I have for now. Do we have any questions? Yes. Let's go, let's go over here first. Can you define significant? <laughs> that question comes up all the time. You know, what is a significant impact? Because um, the, the, the policies are pretty clear. If, is it significant or less than significant? But there's no appendix with a chart telling you the answer. And significance for an, for an impact is really the context. Um, sometimes the decision's easy where say like you know there's a water quality standard or an air pollution standard and if a project you know something really big may result the analysis if it may show that the threshold is exceeded then it's kind of easy to make a policy decision yes it's significant because the whole county is out of compliance with dust emissions for ex hypothetical example um, other times like in the emerging universe of the sage grouse conservation and the draft plans, we, we're starting to get a really good idea about where the best sage grouse habitat is, and there's lots of maps. And um, a policy decision could be based on, well, there's like too much stuff going on, too close to too many sage grouse breeding habitat sites, lex. And um, it's it's put in context and, and um, how, many, how much is too much is still the context of whether it's a project that's in a big area or a small area, is, the, is a safe for wildlife, is the disturbance ongoing or is it short term? These are the elements that get to um, the call of whether it's significant or not. And um, that's not a clear answer because there really is no clear answer a lot of times. But um, it's, uh, ultimately it's up to the, um, the, uh, the specific people at the, at the federal agency doing the action to make the finding. And um, if we remember our flow chart of different types of analyses, um, uh, an environmental assessment as a way to look at the project must draw a conclusion of no significant impact, or it must incorporate a lot of mitigation measures so the impacts are reduced so they're no longer significant. The other pathway is to um, prepare an environmental impact statement, which essentially can admit, yes, it has some significant impacts for whatever the issue may be, but the decision, the, the action or the decision by the agency could still happen in full awareness that some impacts may be significant. Um, and like what I showed before, we're now, so more things have better mitigation, we're, we have emerging policies through regional mitigation about, you know, some of these regions could be pretty big, about if you um, have the option to look farther and wider for mitigation options, then the impact will be less than significant because we have more options on how to mitigate it. But I wish there were a simple chart sometimes, you know, uh, but there's not. Yeah, hi. I, uh, I see you have a, um, you, you have one of the slides depicts the time frames for uh, public comment and that kind of thing. Yeah. Is there a guideline or time frame for BLM to develop uh, those phases. So once you submit an application, or is there a, a 
there laws or rules that say you have to have something done by so many days? Not really, um, because the poten there, there is no tip. Usually, there's no set schedule because the analysis required could be simple or complicated, or it may take field data over several seasons. Um, you know, uh, some projects are really they require a NEPA document, but the project's really simple, and so those could be done in a few months. Um, some, like a major mine or um, giant solar power facilities near Las Vegas that send power to half of North America, those can take longer, like, except when they have high priority from the president, then they go fast. Um, there was some of that a few years ago, before my time. But, um, but there is no set schedule because the kind of project could be so different. But it does, the public review process does have a certain window periods when people can comment. Any, anything else? I got, I got two questions. One's mine, and then one of my Shire members asked me to ask <laughs> how many project alternatives need to be analyzed. But my question is, uh, who makes the decision? Uh, does Amy make the decision? Is it a team of experts? Uh, is it... Uh, higher level than the state, who, who makes the decision? But yeah, like I say, the other one is how many project alternatives? On alternatives? Well, um, uh, sort of one of the, the artful outcomes of the law is not that it, like I showed earlier about disclosure, it's not that it's a, like a regulation, but it's more, NEPA is more of a process. And part of the process is that um, the purpose of the project or the action, the purpose has to be defined in a, not too narrow, not too specific, but the purpose like um, transmit electricity from point A, B, and C, and the alternatives could be different ways to route the lines. Um, have lots of small towers, put it underground, you know, there's all kinds of alternatives that Two, could come out. Seven. I'm, is there I'm getting there. Oh, oh, and there um, so the point is, I need hard no oh. there are no hard, hard numbers. Um, the, point, the point is the artful part of the law is that it's a process to come up with a good decision. So you need to look at the purpose of the proposal. And um, sometimes it seems like there's like one sensible alternative, like say what comes up a lot is say you have a pipeline put it along the highway because it's already disturbed ground. And that's, that's an alternative. And then, like I was in a class yesterday about this, another alternative could be take the short route, which may not be follow the road, but go through the sensitive bird habitat, but it's the short route. Well, that alternative could get on the list, but it probably would not get a lot of analysis because the, the adverse impacts are so obvious. So in this example, there were, say, besides the alternative of doing nothing, which we have to do, we've got three potential for this hypothetical pipeline. There's like three potential alternatives. But um, there is no set number ex except um, you have to do one project. You have to analyze no project to put it all in relative comparison. And that's the minimum. But that doesn't mean it's a good decision in the process because if the, remember NEPA is about disclosure and making good decisions. So if, if not a few options, like, you know, three, three or four, if these options are not analyzed, then it's hard to know whether a good decision was made because it wasn't compared to anything. So um, there's an artful part for the, for the wonky level seminar, the wonkier level seminar. Um, there's a section where potential alternatives that never got much study still have to be explained. You know, like um, this pipeline could have put, put it through the rare bird habitat or it could have gone through the creek full of cutthroat trout, but we didn't analyze those because that's just crazy to go through endangered species habitat. But you put that in the report, so then um, the public knows, at least somebody thought of it, 
And therefore, the pipeline along the road, which some people may not like, is still a smart decision. So I, um, when I used to work for another federal agency, we were looking at mi mining in Florida. We had 20 alternatives on our initial list, and we cut that down to six. And we had lively staff discussions about which six made the list. Um, but uh, it sort of depends, like the other question, which is the art of NEPA, about the context and the complexity about how many alternatives that get to the same answer still make sense to analyze. So in the strict sense, you can have only two, but that's not very wise because it leaves open questions that things may have been ignored. I like to think for a moderately complex one, four or five feels good because you got some confidence, you've looked at a range of options. But I wanted to get my other prong, uh, oh, my, yeah. my actual question, who decides? Who decides? Um, well, at, at Bureau of Land Management, the decision-making authority is delegated to our field offices and our district offices. Um, in, in my observation, I haven't read a policy document yet about that. It just makes sense because there's a lot of routine stuff that still has to be analyzed. You know, um, uh, you know, a road, a pipeline, a grazing permit. Um, there's just a lot of vol high volume, hopefully low intensity analysis. And the idea is that people in the field kind of know what's going on and can um, decide and analyze and, and know how to make the good decision in the, in the end. So, um, but the way the, um, the process works is actually a government official by name and title who signs the document and is often um, the one held accountable um, when people challenge it. So it could be the field manager or the district director um, um, as a kind of standard way I've observed we do things at BLM in Nevada. But other agencies do things differently and they often have a top-down um, decision-making authority. Like it could be the top official in the whole state is the one who signs on. Or you know, an oil pipeline from northern Canada to New Orleans could be you know, the, the Secretary of State could be the one who signs it. But um, yeah, it's sort of delegated for efficiency. But what we do great at the Nevada office is that when projects get complicated, there's a whole bunch of nerds at the state office who know hydrology or birds or air quality, and they'll get the draft document through the miracles of email, we get the draft document, and we'll help the people in the field write a better product. So there's often a lot of fingers in the pie, but eventually it's one person in the field who's the decider. Okay, that's good. Thanks. We formed, we formed a grazing subgroup, and the question was, how much is enough and how much is too much? Um, and when we were making those recommendations, we didn't have a good answer to that question, which influenced what our recommendations are. We certainly understand there's trade-offs, and it seems like EAs have been getting a little bit longer every year. Right. I think CEQ guidance says 10 to 15 pages, which would be a nice, easy read. Um, right. But reading, you know, 150 pages, and I know BLM personnel who's on the ground who should be spending a lot of time in the field, that comes at expense when we're writing a 150-page document. And that's one of the concerns I have and I don't know what BLM's direction is, but is there any way to kind of scale those things back and put the necessary information in without overkilling it? Well, um, you're getting to a point that people notice all the time. And, um, and in fact, sort of the, the oversight agency, the Council on Environmental Quality, issued a policy document a couple years ago reminding people, like, you don't have to make this that complicated. Just deal with what you need to deal with and not go on with endless background about, you know, life since 
people hunted bison with pointed sticks, which some, some people have too much background. So we're supposed to make them streamlined and to the point, and the art of it is how you're defining the initial federal action or the project. And um, if, the, if the project is kind of open-ended or vague, then the analysis has to be kind of complex. So um, an, o a, an element of an environmental assessment or an in impact statement is called the purpose and need statement, which has to be broad enough to allow different options to get to the outcome, but not so broad that almost anything seems like it could satisfy the need. And, you know, and I was in a class earlier this week, and there were examples like um, the purpose of the project is to provide electricity to um, citizens of the United States. You're like, well, a lot of things could do that when all they really meant was a 10-kilometer transmission line in, in the middle of Utah or something. So um, a way to make the documents more concise is to really know what you're asking for. And um, at the same time, when we go through scoping, sort of people get together and think about the issues. They need to stay on point about it's what the issue really may be. And there's, uh, it's called an, um, they're called issue issue statement. So instead, say for um, say for a grazing permit as a potential decision. Um, the, the question to be analyzed needs to be specific in the form of a question, not like, how will this affect the water? It should be, a spring is down, down, downstream, there's a spring or two, and the water level seems to go up and down, so how will grazing or whatever affect that spring water table? And then, you, then you, people know what to chew on specifically through because they learn this great question through the scoping process, they know what to focus on the, in the environmental assessment. And there's more and more examples of if the document is defined really well up front, and then it analyzes it and answers the question, it's really hard for someone on the outside to challenge it because it did what it said it was gonna do. Um, but it, there, there, to your other point, um, environmental assessments are often getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And when is it really the same as an environmental impact statement is an awfully fuzzy boundary. And it's something my colleagues and I talk about all the time. Um, and I, I often think in the long term, just preparing an EIS, environmental impact statement, from the beginning actually could save time in the long run. Because if they're going to do a 400-page analysis anyway, the way things go, just admit it up front. So that just depends on the project, but but it's it, it's the investment up front to really define what you're doing, which therefore reduces vulnerability that the analysis wasn't good enough. And a lot of really big documents are because it's too broadly defined. So maybe I'll just follow up on that, and maybe something from the district managers would be helpful. You know, if, if you know your people are sitting there writing a 150-page document when they could be writing a 10- to 15-page document, but you're the ones who are on that decision, you know, is there any way to scale that back so they get that time to go out and actually do the monitoring in the field, do those things, or is that never going to happen? freeze <laughs> yes <laughs> well you know par part of this entire process that that we're discussing here has to do with data collection information collection because after all without the information without the monitoring you can't do the analysis so generally before or during the process of going through NEPA um, there is has there has to be an investment in in the monitoring and the data collection for the analysis so it's all part, it's all connected. Yeah, I'm, you know, and our grazing subgroup was put together to help make recommendations for BLM to get more of those 
EAs done, those permits processed. And I'm just thinking, if I'm sitting, if I'm a range management specialist, sitting in the office writing a 150-page document, there's something else I'm not able to get done. But if I could get that done in 10 to 15 pages, and I could get started on the next one, so I could get caught up, that would make sense to me. And so I guess I'm asking is, do you guys see that as an inefficiency? Can we address that? Can we make things more concise so we can get ahead? Well, I think, uh, you know, NEPA is, we, it is what we make it. And generally it's evolved over the last number of years in response to litigation and appeals. And, and every time there's a, a, a decision that's made and, and routinely we get challenged on NEPA, and I'm talking at broadly as an organization, um, if, we f if a judge determines we fail to comply in, in one or more instances, then we go back and we, we address that and it generally adds to, the, adds to the analysis so that we can continue to be defensible. Um, but I think from my perspective, there's always ways to become more efficient. And, and that's, and, and that's a direct, has a direct relationship to how effective we're managing our offices because we all have conflicting priorities, staffing limitations, but we still have a responsibility to get the job done. And so, yeah, there's, there's ways to be more efficient. I think in Nevada, we've talked at, at, as, a, as an SLT um, many time, in many instances about how to become more efficient in our processes. Um, but, but yeah, I, I met on a side note, um, my predecessor, on his way to retirement, Jerry Smith uh, gave me a, uh, a an EA from 1974, and it was a one-page document, and it, it was a checklist. We're going to do this. This is the federal action. Does wildlife exist? Yes or no? That was the analysis, and it was a one-pager, and I got it in my office. So you know we've we've gone we've come a long way since then I would imagine we've had some updated guidance since then yeah that's a that's that, that's a company line right there but updated I'll, guide I'll offer in here um, one way for sort of routine actions to be analyzed quickly is where people in the field could have good access to um, high quality products to use as a template and um, I was in a class earlier this week where people brought their draft. EAs, environmental assessments, and they were comparing what they had written up or what they inherited from someone in their office who's been recycling a document for five years, um, you know, save under a different name. And, and we compared it to sort of like an ideal, efficient, concise one, and all kinds of revelations came out about how to stop running around in verbal or written circles, how to stop chasing a tail to just Here's some concise language. Just use it routinely. And um, we are really at the Nevada State Office and our districts, we're tightening up how to share documents through e-planning, the NEPA register, which the public can get to as well. And so we're, we're going to be more aware of who's doing what out there in the field um, because we can find successful EAs that are get to the point and don't take a lot of time instead of entry level staff kind of rethinking it all the time. So I, you know, I'll just pitch it for better statewide coordination and file transfers as a way to be more efficient. It was very illustrative the last couple of days in this class about people bringing their documents and some people were way off point and they leave the agency vulnerable in the end if the document missed the point it could be challenged, and so everyone's kind of anticipating that. Okay, one more. All right. You have a quick one? I, I do have a quick one. The gentlewoman from Carson City. So Raul told us this morning that um, the Greater Sage Grass Amendment had 15,000 comments. Um, so that's a challenge that BLM is going to have to deal with. So can you talk to us about do more comments support a particular position? Do more comments that support a p particular position influence the agency's decision? Well, in the broad sense, that's sort of policy and politics, but under NEPA, no. More comments. More comments or redundant comments do not change the facts. So, um, 
So say in the, the sage grouse plan, which just closed the public comment period, it could have 5,000 comments that specify, um, we think your map is wrong because of this, this, and this. Um, one person who can explain why the map is wrong is helping BLM just as well as 10,000 people saying the map is wrong. If the bird is or is not there, it is or is not there. And it's not, um, it's not a democracy under a NEPA analysis. It's, it's just the facts. So um, one um, clarification of a fact is just as good as a thousand. Um, in big, you know, as we know, in big high profile proposals, people just say, I love sage grouse, I hate sage grouse, I love horses, I hate horses, too many horses, not enough horses, whatever. Um, it still only needs to hit the point once to have the, the document reevaluate between the draft and the final. So um, this comes up a lot and it's, it, it just sort of highlights that NEPA is a decision-making process, not um, a final policy interpretation. It's just that the decision has to be informed. Okay, thanks. And that's our time. There you go. My next present. My next presentation will have more cartoons, more animation, and more maps. Thank you. And actually, that is right. We ended just on time. So uh, now what we're going to do is get into your breakout sessions. Uh, unfortunately, we've only got two rooms, this one here and then uh, gallery three. So what I would ask is that whichever rack has the largest amount of members here, uh, they could take gallery three. Okay, <laughs> I'll let you guys fight it out, but uh, they take gallery three and the other two could meet up here because I know the Southern Nevada contingent's fairly small this year. So we could have, yeah. Oh, that's true, yeah, we just went over all that. But we've got two hours for your breakout session. We start the public comment period at 4 p.m., so we would like you back by then. And we're also going to be serving snacks at about 2.30. Yes, sir. Given as how the appointment, reappointment letters have yet to be issued, um, and we may or may not meet quorum requirements, and one of the key actions for this meeting is election of officers. How can we proceed on those items on our individual RAC agendas? If there are decisions to be made right now uh, and you don't have the quorum, then you could defer the decision until the nomination letters come through and hold your votes uh, via email or via some other method. Um, then you can just have the discussion now in terms of what you want to speak to. Okay, we'll sort through that. And unless my rack throws something at me, uh, we would like to offer the following recommendation that historically we'd had the tri rack in November and the appointments coincided with that period of time and enabled us to put together work plans at the beginning of the year and begin implementation of them in the appropriate calendar year. Here we are in February for the tri rack we don't have all the appointments in our rack fully functional so strong recommendation to interior please that it would be really good to have the appointments in place by the time we have the tri rack and push the thing back into the to the tail into the preceding year you guys good with that yep apparently my, my rack concurs so <laughs> Yeah, and thank you for the input, and that's one thing we have discussed at the state office is ways to streamline the nomination process and hopefully reduce the amount of time it is taking. Thanks. Yep. All right, you're free to go to your breakout sessions.